Why don't we just sack all this off and just take a Zempec then? Ah, yeah, great question. So the the I have a. Uh, I have kept my finger on the pulse of the whole field of gut-derived hormones, which is what we talk about with these weight loss drugs, almost since their beginning. My dissertation work was in a lab, one of the first funded labs to look at these drugs, although in the context of diabetes, and then it's blossomed into the context in the use of obesity. This, this is the class of drug, GLP-1 receptor agonist. First of all, what is GLP-1? GLP-1 is a hormone that we all make from our guts. Our small intestine will make GLP-1. We're making it all the time to varying degrees. Some things we eat will result in a higher GLP-1. Sometimes it'll be a lower GLP-1. Like for example, a paper just published a few months ago found that if you have people eat the exact same meal of calories, but lower carb or higher carb, the lower carb version of the meal will increase GLP-1 three times higher in the blood than the high carb version of the meal. Which so, means that they'll feel yeah, so then the bent, what, so what's the point? Who cares about GLP-1? One of GLP-1's main effects is to tell the brain that we're full. Okay, so more GLP-1, less More hungry. satiety. Yeah, yeah, more GLP-1, less hunger, which is very impactful. In fact, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a study that was published in humans a, a while ago. They took obese humans and lean humans and had them eat fat and found that, like, pure fat, and they found that the GLP-1 response was the same. Whether you were lean or obese, you had the same amount of GLP-1. That would suggest that whether you're lean or obese, both of your brains in both of these populations will have the fat and have the same sense of, I'm full. It would, because it, it was matched with GLP-1. However, when they had these same groups eat pure carbohydrate, the lean group had a robust GLP-1 response, big GLP-1. In other words, they would eat the carbohydrate and say, I'm full because GLP-1 would tell them so. However, in the obese group, they ate that exact same amount of carbohydrate and they had an almost negligible GLP-1 effect. They were still hungry. In other words, they would eat the same amount of carbohydrate as their lean counterpart and then just say, okay, what's next? I'm still hungry. And so it is prudent to focus on GLP-1. GLP-1 is a powerful hormone that does have an effect on human health. What I feel inclined to comment on is the negative side effects because the only thing we hear about is social media influencers extolling the benefits. And hey, I'm on this weight loss drug and I've lost 50 pounds. Someone has to be the voice that says, yeah, but what about this? And there are some significant but what abouts when it comes to these um, weight loss drugs. One of them is the loss of muscle mass or lean mass. You've mentioned a couple papers from the New England Journal of Medicine, a paper a couple years ago from what was called the Step 5 trials looking at these drugs. They found that for every six pounds of fat a person was losing on these drugs, they were losing four pounds of fat-free mass or lean mass. So 40% of the weight they were losing uh, on these drugs is coming from lean mass, like including muscle and bone. So there are now case reports of young, healthy women who are overweight, who go on the drug for some period of time, and after they get diagnosed with osteoporosis, where they have eroded their bone health, they're losing lean mass. So again- They've eroded their bone health. Yeah, so 40% of the weight that people are losing on these drugs appears to, at these high doses is coming from lean mass. So fat-free mass, including muscle and bone. The reason I find that so troubling is that in the UK, at two years on the drug, 69% of people get off the drug. They don't want to be on it anymore. And now imagine this individual. Imagine, if you will, a 60-year-old woman who's been on the drug. I take that age and that sex on, on purpose because it's so hard for her to, to grow new muscle and bone. Let's say she's been on this drug for a year and she's lost 20 kilos. Well, 40% of that will have come from her lean mass and 60% of it came from her fat. And then when she gets off the drug, now all of a sudden, her lean mass, her muscle and bone, that's never coming back. The muscle and bone that she has lost is gone forever, probably at that age, because we can't, at, after the age of 60, good luck developing new muscle and bone. But what can come back rapidly is the fat mass. And so at two years, she decides to get off the drug, which again, about 70% of people do, they're going to gain that fat back, but they're not going to gain their muscle and bone back. That is a significant loss that may be, depending on their age, 
gone forever. I was scrolling on Twitter the other day and I saw a video going viral, which is now being reported in a bunch of news publications. It was yesterday that I saw um, this video going viral. And I'm going to play this video to you. It's from a singer called Avery. And she talks about her experience with a Zempec. I just left the doctor's office. I went to get a checkup because I've been off of Ozempic for two months now and I just wanted to see if my body was in better condition, if there were any permanent damages. Kind of in shock right now because I wasn't expecting this, but um, I guess Ozempic can cause bone density loss. And I didn't think that that would happen to me because I was only on it for a year, um, but I have significant bone loss. I have osteoporosis and um, osteopenia, so that or there's like several of them that I have. I wasn't expecting that, but that's what happens if you um, if you use Ozempic uh, for weight loss and you lose too much weight. Yeah, I wonder. She's so lean. I wouldn't be surprised if she had it even worse than normal because we see it has become. I don't mean to suggest this is the case for her. But you do see people using these weight loss drugs who are already very lean. I mean, I've got a picture of her here, and she does look incredibly lean already. But see, this is what people are doing. They're basically using it to facilitate an eating disorder in the people who are lean. Um, this has become so common that there are complaints saying that you know lean, healthy people are getting the prescription and people who are obese and diabetic aren't because of shortages. The more, the, the leaner, I've seen this. I know someone personally who was already a perfectly lean, healthy woman, and then she now looks sickly. Um, and what caused it? Well, she wasn't lean enough. And when you take enough of that drug that you just have no more hunger because of how it's acting at your brain, you do just stop eating. And the malnutrition, at least in part, is going to cause a loss of lean mass. Um, but that also... Play, it, it is even further exacerbated by the mental health problems where there was a paper recently published with the use of these drugs finding that people, when they begin the drug, their risk of suicidal thoughts doubles. It goes up by over 100%. And their risk of major depression triples. And this, so as much as we talk about these drugs and we say the drug helps you control your cravings, what it's hap what it's doing is perhaps reducing your craving for everything. That while you are eating less food, which is resulting in the weight loss, you also are not interested as much in exercise as you used to be, which is going to make it even easier for you to lose your muscle and bone. You're also less interested in hobbies like going to play pickleball with your friends or going out and drinking with the boys. Um, so there is this kind of what's reflected across all of their interests is that their cravings for everything starts to decline. On the case of that girl mentioned there, Avery, I've just seen she's uploaded a post that says, thanks, my record label told me I was fat. They dropped me. I got addicted to a Zempec. Oh my gosh. I got addicted to a Zempec and now as a result, I have osteoporosis and my bones are as fragile as wafer cookies. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Um, So now that... Obviously, you know, these are claims that she's alleging. Now we don't yeah. know the full picture of her health sure, and there sure. might be something more. Yeah. But we do know, based on the one report, that 40% of weight loss is coming from fat-free mass. And so it is in people's best interest to be mindful of that tendency and that if they're going to explore the use of the drug, to do so responsibly. And, and I want to mention that um, kind of caveat or angle to everything because I don't want someone listening to me thinking, all right, Ben says I should never touch this and it is uniformly evil and bad. I'm not saying that. I find that I have to speak a little more boldly about the negative consequences because nobody talks about them. What would she have done if she knew about them, for example? No one knows about these kinds of negatives because people wanna sweep them under the rug. Now, I believe there is a use case for these drugs, although different from how it's being used currently. In my mind, the best use of these drugs is to help someone learn how to control their carbohydrate addiction because it will help you control your addiction. Sweet cravings, goes down significantly within six months of the person taking the drug. So I think in addition to getting proper education, and if I may be so bold, I would say it's those pillars I mentioned earlier, control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, and don't fear fat. 
all the more reason prioritize protein and fat to help preserve your muscle and bone. Muscle and bone are not made of carbohydrate. They're made of, of protein and fat. Eat protein and fat. Lift weights to keep any of that lean mass you can. Keep the integrity of your bones intact. But take advantage of the drug, helping reduce your cravings for sweet things especially. I would say find the lowest effective dose you can where you are able, with a little bit of self-discipline, where you're not assigning all of the self-discipline to the syringe that you're gonna inject into your tummy. There is value in learning to deny yourself something you know you shouldn't be doing. There's life lessons to learn there. And so, so enough of the drug that makes it a little easier for you to overcome your carbohydrate addiction. At the same time, you're learning how to eat well. You're learning how to eat properly by managing your macronutrients and lifting weights. And then over time, ideally, I would say, you find that you are able to reduce the dose of the drug and then eventually get off of it entirely. It's worth saying that I, I did also search to see if there was a link between a Zempec and bone density, and there was no clear link in the studies that have been done. I, I don't know whether there's been a lot of studies done, mm -hmm. but it says in the studies and reviews, semaglutide generally shows no harmful effect on bone mineral density, although rapid weight loss itself can sometimes affect bone health. Yeah, so I actually think it's an artifact. That's a term that we would use as a scientist to say that it's, it's, an, it's an effect that's happening without being a main effect. So I don't believe the GLP-1 drug is attacking the bone. Yeah. I think it's because the person has just stopped eating and stopped moving. Remember what I said earlier, people find that they're just less interested in doing stuff, like going to the gym, for example. Um, and so that is probably combining where a little bit of malnutrition combined with a little less physical activity means you're accelerating some lean mass loss. One of the things that this podcast has taught me is that liposuction is dangerous. Do you agree with that statement? I do. Uh, from a metabolic perspective, I absolutely do. Um, liposuction is not dangerous to fit into the clothes you want to wear, but it's deeply problematic for metabolic health. And that's because, as a reminder, it's not the mass of fat we have that matters most when it comes to metabolic health. It's the size of our fat cells. So let's imagine an individual who has more fat than they want in some particular part of the body. The best way to help reduce that fat is to shrink your fat cells. So that's very important for people to realize. When you lose weight, you're not killing fat cells. You're not, you're not getting rid of them, you're shrinking them. And small fat cells are very healthy fat cells. They are literally anti-inflammatory. They're releasing hormones that fight inflammation in the body and they're very insulin sensitive, which helps the body by extension be very insulin sensitive. So very healthy. Small fat cells are healthy fat cells. The problem with liposuction is that you are going in and rather than shrinking the fat cells, you are sucking them out. Now, let's say like a study that was done in the US in women, they found that when women had liposuction from their buttocks and hips area, um, which is where most women gain their weight, which is because of sex hormones, telling her body to store that weight there. They may look at that fat on their buttocks and hips and say, there's more than I want. I'm going to suck it out. So they do, but they don't change their habits. So they're still eating the same way they were before. Essentially, now they have fewer fat cells, but the body wants to store that same amount of fat based on how they're eating. In other words, there's enough insulin telling the body to store a certain amount of fat, and there's enough calories to fuel that fat storage. But the, the fat would be saying, hey, we don't have all these fat cells in the buttocks and hips like we used to. Let's go somewhere else. And so it's no surprise that over the ensuing years after she's had liposuction, not only does she not experience any improvement in any health marker, nothing gets better with regards to her health. And that is, again, reflective of the fact that it's the size of the fat cell that matters. Maybe she has lost 10 kilos of fat. That might be a little much for liposuction. Six kilos. And you would say, well, you have six kilos of less fat. Clearly, you're healthier. And yet, they're not at all. Nothing has gotten better. And then if you follow them over the years, they cannot gain that fat back on their buttocks and hips because it was literally sucked out. And adults have a hard time making new fat cells. So it's no surprise that they start storing more fat in an area that wasn't sucked out, namely their belly. And so a woman who's gone through liposuction, yes, she will have lost fat by liposuction at her buttocks and hips, 
But if she doesn't change her lifestyle habits, the body will take those six kilos and say, well, I need to store those now somewhere else because you're eating in a way that makes me want to store that much fat. And so her remaining fat cells that are intact get bigger and store a bigger burden. And so over time, it's no surprise that health outcomes can start to get worse. By having fewer fat cells, she's increasing the burden that the remaining fat cells have to carry. Not only does that result in a, a change in where she's storing fat, namely storing more on her abdomen, but all the fat cells will get bigger and thus metabolic health can get worse. If you love the Diver CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.